Welcome to Concordia Theological Seminary and to our podcast. Today we'll be looking at Proper 23, which is Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. And that, of course, is the parable of the uh, marriage feast. Now, first you think about where this falls within the Gospel of Matthew. And uh, for a little while now, we've been in the vineyard. So when you think about the structure of Matthew, um, in chapter 10, he sends the workers out, and then we get the stories in chapter 13 of the field. And the ministry is compared to a field where the wheat is grown. Now, in the field, of course, um, that's the grain from which the bread crumb comes. Um, and after that, as the, as the gospel proceeds, then we go to the vineyard. And in the vineyard is also, again, a place of work. Um, we had the story of the parable of the laborers in the vineyard and about you know how it's good to um, it is good to work there all the day to be appreciative of the, to be appreciative of the fact that we have this great honor and privilege of working in the Lord's vineyard there's no better way to spend the day and then we had the question of the sons well, you know one goes out to work and another doesn't um, and then you go to the the story of the tenants of the vineyard these are these are the people who are given charge of the vineyard, and yet every time that the master asks for uh, the payment, they kill the messengers, and finally they kill the son himself. And that's a parable of what happens, of course, to, the, to uh, Jesus Christ, who is sent by God the Father into the vineyard, and then the workers in the vineyard, the Jewish leaders, his own people, end up killing him. And uh, this tells us that this vineyard will soon be given over to the church, uh, largely to, to, to the Gentiles. And it's also kind of interesting because right after the story of the death of the owner's son, then we have a story of the wedding feast. So if we might think of that previous story as being a kind of a Good Friday, and now this is an Easter morning, this is a wedding feast, we are now to the point of celebration. Now the, the grapes have been harvested, and um, well, before we ate bread, now we enjoy the second part of that meal, which is the wine, which is the, uh, it's the aspect of the Lord's Supper that points to celebration. So if you look at chapter 22, you see that the kingdom, he says, Jesus again spoke to them in parables. So Matthew's the gospel of, of parables. And the kingdom of the heavens, this is a good Matthean phrase that which we've seen from the beginning, is like a man who is a king, and he made now a great wedding feast. Now, this is dear to my heart. I think we need to help our people understand how, how Jesus himself is the, the bridegroom. Jesus is the one in his first sign in the Gospel of, of John who, who changed the water into wine and thereby bless the wedding at Cana. Um, John the Baptist calls himself the friend of the bridegroom and he introduces Jesus who is the groom. Uh, we also know that heaven, as we're going to see in the, in the book of Revelation, is itself a wedding feast. Well, we don't have to go to the Gospel of John or Revelation to see that. We can see this also in the Gospel, in the gospel of Matthew. This is what the heavenly vision looks like the kingdom of the heavens shall be compared to a man who has a wedding feast for his son. Um, so God the Father for his son is ready to celebrate the resurrection. So what does he do? Well, here's that apostolic word. He sends out his servants or his slaves. This is what Matthew, this is what Matthew records in Matthew 28 when he sent the Great Commission. He will send them out to call Calaisi or to summon those who have been called into the feast. Ah, but alas, they did not want to come. So this is the truth of, of our preaching of the gospel. We preach, and so often the first group says, no, they don't want to come. Um, so uh, in verse 4, again, he sent out other servants. Again, he sent out alus, dulus saying, say to those who have been called, so he gives them a second chance, behold this Ariston, in verse 4, um, 
that, that word is a feast. Interestingly, that word originally meant lunch or, or breakfast, and then it became kind of, I guess, a brunch or a lunch. In some ways, I, it might signal the fact that we are moving away from the Passover meal, which is an evening meal, to a morning or a brunch meal. And that, that's the way we usually experience, for instance, in the church life. Um, when I think of the Passover, I think of the evening setting. When I think of the, of the church life, I think of coming together on Sunday morning and celebrating the festival. And if things are going really well on Easter, then you get a, a breakfast to go with that. But So it's almost like an Easter brunch here. And I have, I have prepared for this. And, and the, animals have been, the animals have been killed. So this is a good feast. So um, my ox and my fat calves have been slaughtered. So the, everything's been ready. These are, you know, like wagyu meat. It's like the, the, the cows have been massaged. They've, been, they've eaten well. And now um, the, the, these are fatted calves, the fatted ones right there. And um, they have been slaughtered. So everything's ready. I mean, this is, if you've had a dinner party, you know the kind of work that goes into it. Now come to the, come to the wedding feast, he says to them. Um, but you know, it's, it's, a, it's really maybe perplexing, but they, they didn't have any care for this. And um, so, so they just went off. They didn't listen. And where did they go? Well, one went to, I mean, there's a lot of different reasons you could go, but one went in verse 5 to his agron, so went to his farm. The other went to his emporium, that is, to his, to his business. If we could bring this up on verse 5 and 6. So this is, you know, there's the country mouse um, who goes away to his agron, and there's the city mouse who goes away to his business, but they are, they're busy. <laughs> and isn't this the way every single uh, Sunday morning is? We... We invite people to the feast. We invite people to the Lord's Supper, to the life of the church, to a foretaste of the feast to come. And what are they doing? Well, they're busy about doing the things that they do. Some might be working out in the field. Some might be working out in the business. I guess some might be doing other things entirely, I suppose, just sleeping. Um, but for whatever reason, they do not want to come to the feast. Um, in verse 6, then, we see that um, while, while the rest, they grabbed the, the servants and, or the slaves, and they were hubris on. Uh, uh, hubristic, is, it's full of um, uh, scorn and contempt uh, for, for others, thinking, thinking too much of yourself and too little of others. And they killed them, so it's pretty awful. And you can imagine, so... It, when you think about this, this comes after um, the story of the vineyard in which they kill the king's son. Now, did they learn anything from this? Well, no. And so they killed the prophets in the Old Testament. So also the, uh, the apostles they're going to kill too. Um, from what we know, 11 of the 12 apostles died a, a, a martyr's death. And so we see that uh, God sends out his apostles and then his missionaries after that, and uh, many are killed in the line of duty. Well, what, what do we expect the king to do? Well, he reacts in anger. I mean, this is, the king's done nothing but good for his people. He sends out an invitation. It's perplexing, it's baffling. Um, maybe psychologically, they don't want to have to acknowledge that the king is the king. Maybe they don't want to be beholden to him, uh, but they're going to miss out on this. So he sent, his, he sent his troops there. He sent his soldiers, and they destroyed, and he destroyed the murderers, those murderers, and their cities, their city he, he burned. So um, the Gospel of Matthew and Jesus is not afraid to speak about judgment. And neither should we be afraid. And we, we speak about how our Lord has redeemed us of the good things to come. But we do our people a disservice if we do not tell them, if we do not warn them of the consequences. And in some ways, this is the, 
Again, it's the worst of all sins because having committed so many sins ourselves, yet our Lord forgives us, He invites us to the feast, and this is the ultimate act of, of, condes of, of, de of, of condescending, of looking down upon the God, to look down upon the God who created us and to despise the Son who redeemed us. It really is uh, the worst of, of, of our fallen humanity that's shown here, and we are warned against this kind of senseless faithlessness. And so, well, what is he going to do? Um, well, it, there's still going to be a party, um, and I have a friend who likes to put it this way. Um, well, we're having a great party, and you're not coming because you've got some problem. Well, it stinks to be you. And uh, they're going to miss out, but there's still going to be a heavenly party. So, in verse 8, he says to his servants, uh, The feast is ready, but those who called were not worthy. Now, you think about Jesus says things like this throughout the Gospel of Matthew. He says, don't cast your pearls before swine. He says, if you go to a town or a city and they reject you, or to a home and they reject you, shake the dust off of your sandals because they weren't worthy of you. And I think this is important to, uh, as the church is that the church must understand her dignity. And we as pastors must understand that we offer salvation. And um, if people reject us, it's not because, it's not, um, it's not on us anymore. If we do our job, if we preach the gospel, if we invite to the feast, then we've done what our Lord has, has told us to do. But if they reject it, well, then it is on them. And they truly have proven themselves by their rejection to be, to be unworthy. So therefore, go to the thoroughfares the, of the roads, the highways and byways, and whatever you find, summon them to the, to the banquet. And I love this because our Lord is not a person who, the Lord God does not care about who is rich and who has status. He invites, he invites everyone. Going out, the servants then went into the roads and they, they brought all those that they found, anybody you find. And um, I was just watching a story about a wonderful uh, man in Africa who was, um, he ran an orphanage there, and uh, he would just go and um, he'd find any kid on the street sleeping at night um, by himself, and he'd just take that kid up in his arms and bring him on home. It was quite, quite a beautiful and moving picture. And uh, here, we're not checking credentials. Uh, you don't have to have some sort of, uh, any kind of, uh, you don't have to be a model or a rich person to enter into this club, which is the greatest feast of all time. You just have to be willing to go, I suppose. And uh, so he gathered everybody. The, the, the evil and the good. I mean, those people who are known as, you know, these kinds of righteous guys, people guys, people that you would just say there's a pillar of the community. And also the kind of people that maybe are liars and cheats and all of that. Well, all are welcome at the table, and the banquet was filled, and they were reclining. So good news. In some ways, I suppose the story should end there, but uh, there's one other bit of business to deal with because there's still a problem. Because um, So the king came in, the Basileus came in, and he was looking out at all those who there were seated or reclined. And, well, what happens? See, everything looks good. Everybody's ready for the feast, but there is a man who was not wearing the, the garment. He had not put on the garment of the wedding. So it was. I mean, do clothes matter? Well, in a way, I suppose they do. Um, uh, there were, in previous generations, the people did dress up for church, and I think that's good. I think now, um, sometimes I'll find myself in a golf shirt and... Uh, but when you come to church, you recognize that this is a special occasion. But it's not that we're talking about here. Um, what we're talking about here is the garment of the wedding, and that's, that's, that's more significant than simply dressing up. What it means is, I think, the wedding of the garment is those who are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. That is to say, the garment that we're given is a fulfillment of the garment given to Adam and Eve when they were found naked and they saw themselves to be naked in the Garden of Eden. And thinking themselves naked, they made fig leaves, fig leaves for themselves. 
Well, that wasn't enough, so our Lord gave them a, you know, clothing made out of the sacrifice of an animal. Um, but that was what our Lord gave, but it was still pointing to the, the greater covering. And the greater covering, of course, is, is Christ Himself. When we are baptized, we put on Christ. Now, in some ways, I do think we have to deal with this. Um, you know, I, I do, I do uh, wonder with my evangelical friends, and um, I, want, I want in kindness to say this, but uh, we come into the Lord's presence because we are clothed with Christ. That clothing comes in our baptism. It's freely given. Um, so we dare not despise that. Um, to come apart from this is to say that uh, in some ways it's, it's a horrible, again, act of insolence. It's, it's like I belong here on my own, on my own status, that I belong in the kingdom of God by virtue of my virtues, because of my own righteousness, as we think about the, you know, the, the Reformation. That, but I, I'm not here on my own righteousness. I'm here because... Christ has died for me. That's what makes, I think, this such an offense for the king because this garment would have been given by the king to all those who came to the wedding. It's not like simply, oh, come in a garment if you can't afford a tuxedo. Well, then you can't come in. No, this garment is given as a gift to those who are entering into the feast. So it makes it um, a terrible act of ingratitude to say, no, I won't. I won't come like that. It's, it's really an act of defiance. Um, against the man who is holding the feast. So uh, the king looks at this and says, I lo- it's one of those words, again, I love. It says, friend, or hey, buddy, <laughs> how did you come in here not having the garment of the wedding? Um, it, it, it makes no sense, except, of course, it's a way of saying, it's a, it's a way of really um, looking down on the king and... Uh, the king, of course, will have none of it, and the man is left. The man is left speechless because what could he say? He, he couldn't defend himself. So the king came in and he said to his, "There, it's, now we we change from doulos to diakonois. So to his ministers, I suppose, bind up his feet and hands and throw him out into, and this is hard, into the outer darkness." where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, this is, this is the description of hell. And we get it again and again. We had it, um, for instance, with the centurion. And the centurion has a faith that our Lord had not found in all of Israel in chapter 8 of Matthew. And um, our Lord marvels at that faith. And he said, he's going to be uh, reclining with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of the heavens. Well, the sons of the, sons of the kingdom... Um, the Jewish people, the unbelievers, though, they will be outside in, in the darkness in, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And it's so pointless because, I mean, it, it's just pathetic because inside the feast is the music, inside the feast is the food, it's the good, it's the wine that's flowing from the, from the, from the vineyard, from the grapes that have been harvested. All of those things are ours. Uh, if we only, I mean, the, the invitation that's been given to us to throw it all away would be so pointless. And, um, and so it is. Many, many are called, and we recognize this, and many are called. We, we offer this gospel invitation to everybody. We, we, the Lord wants all to be saved. We don't look upon a person as to whether they're rich or poor or powerful or weak. That's not it. We invite everybody to the highways and the byways, but so it is in the kingdom of the heaven that many are called, but then few are chosen. Um, Few end up, and this is again sobering, but I do think it's important because I think there's this kind of feeling, certainly when you look at America, you go to a funeral, even of those who have not been to church in years, if at all, they still have this notion that, oh, everybody goes to heaven and I'll be in a better place. And in some ways, I suppose we just have to read this story and break the news to them that uh, it's simply not true. The day of judgment comes, and it comes on those who, especially those who reject such a wonderful gift. But the wonderful gift is ours. It has been won for us. It's been won for us by the Son of the King who, who was sent to us. And as human race, we put him to death. But having risen from the dead, he invites us through his servants to, uh, to come to the banquet. 
And that's what we do every time, every Sunday we do this. We invite the people to the banquet as we preach this gospel, and they come to the Lord's table. It's a marvelous thing. And uh, woe to the one and pity upon the one who, who rejects such a wonderful invitation. So thank you for this time and God's blessing upon your week as you prepare uh, for the great feast in your own congregation. Thank you.